you will see at the bottom of the screen uh, the number of participants will start increasing when they will start joining in at the moment I just asked the pan the panelists are on YouTube so yeah not, not there not here so the good news is that uh, Leo our friend has made it all the way from England to uh, Lviv with a uh, lots of lots of help in his minivan that him and I loaded on Friday and <laughs> he is a he is a very adventurous guy and <laughs> made it all the way on his own and, uh, and uh, now we are waiting uh, your support from United Kingdom with uh, Leo. Uh, with okay, Leo. We, can, yeah. we can start. Okay, cool. We, okay. Um, I don't see if there are any participants actually joining in. Um, will I see them joining in? Um, on they're, the they're joining in uh, YouTube. That's why you don't see in Zoom. Yeah, ah, oh, nice. everybody's on YouTube. Yeah, everyone is on YouTube. Fine. So I will start then. Okay, um, dear friends, dear colleagues, um, particularly colleagues from Ukraine um, and, and and other countries who um, are joining this webinar, this first webinar that we are arranging with a educational platform called MedVoice. Educational platform MedVoice is based in Odessa um, with the support of uh, Professor Oleg Tarabrin, who I'm going to give a, a word after my initial presentation. Um, I am Andrei Vavinsky. Uh, I'm one of the consultants and institutes at Torbay Hospital in the south of England and also in a few um, hospitals in London. Um, and I have been involved with our Ukrainian colleagues in few educational activities through this platform that has kindly um, offered us uh, an opportunity to deliver webinars, to deliver different courses. And we were actually planning to do a difficult airway course in Kiev in April, but that has to be postponed now for obvious reasons. So we welcome um, everyone who is joining us from and my contacts, other contacts, I know that the advert that I put about this webinar on my Facebook has been shared 25 times, uh, including lots of colleagues of uh, our speaker today from uh, from Turkey. Um, and uh, without uh, wasting more time, I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, who is my very good friend, uh, Zekeria Alanoglu. Um, Zekeria, or Zek, um, uh, that's how he called. He <laughs> likes to be called. Um, he's my good old friend, and we met many years ago in Israel when he was uh, when we both were a lot younger. Uh, since then, he became a professor of anesthesia in Ankara uh, University, uh, and also he worked in the United States. And um, a couple of years ago, I think, or maybe uh, even four, five years ago, we returned back to you. Four years ago. Yeah. He returned yeah. back to uh, St. Louis, and he now works yes. in Washington University, St. Louis, which is a massive center uh, in the middle of America, uh, and uh, he specializes in anesthesia for trauma victims because the St. Louis is also I mean, Washington University is a is a big trauma center, um, and so because of what's happening in Ukraine now, we thought we'll start with something that is topical. Um, and today, um, um, Zach will speak about um, Zach will speak about principles of anesthesia for victims uh, with blunt and penetrating injuries, uh, where they have lots of experience in, in that field. And hopefully, you will pick up some useful trip, uh, tricks and useful techniques and useful approaches uh, gaining from this experience. Before Zach starts. I would like um, Oleg Trabrin to also say a couple of words because he asked me to. Uh, Oleg, uh, please. Uh, good evening, uh, our dear friends, uh, dear speakers, and uh, all our listeners and participants of this webinar. We are very happy for this opportunity to be here with you at such a difficult time for us, for Ukraine. 
Uh, my name is Oleg Tarabrin. In peace, uh, peacetime, uh, I work at the Kyiv International European University as a professor um, of the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. And uh, nowadays, during the war, I am as an anesthesiologist and co-chair of the Volunteer Mobile Hospital in Odessa. We are grateful to you, our dear friends, for your support, uh, us and all our country. Uh, dear Professor Alanogle, the lecture that you uh, give to us are very important for us, especially, especially to this uh, difficult time for Ukraine. Thanks a lot. Uh, dear my friend Andrey Warwinski, thank you very much to you and all your friends and colleagues from United Kingdom and uh, from all our over the world who help to our the mobile hospital and uh, all of Ukraine in such a difficult time uh, for all us. And I would like to express my gratitude uh, to all the wonderful uh, team of the international educational uh, uh, platform Midvoice for uh, organizing such a necessary educational uh, project that we all need. Dear friends, all together we will definitely win. Good luck to everyone and uh, thanks a lot in advance. Thank you very much, Oleg. Um, very inspirational speech. Well done. Yeah. Um, as, as we need to crack on, um, I am very happy for uh, to give away um, the stage to Zach, and uh, he will share the screen with you for his yeah. slides and presentations. Thank you. Let me do it. Yeah, thank you. All right. And... Uh, let me find my presentation. Hopefully, I will find it. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Can you see? Can you see the slides right now, Andre? Fantastic. Yes, I see. Yes, I see. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I would like to start just by thanking my very dear friend, Dr. Warwinski, Andre, actually, and Dr. Tarabin, just extending this very kind invitation uh, to share our, you know, a kind of knowledge with you about the trauma. And I would also like to uh, thank, uh, thank a lot for the Medvoice, uh, for their excellent organization and uh, all the uh, things they put together to make this thing uh, possible. And thank you, Andre, for the um, you know uh, opening statements. Appreciate it. So today's topic is actually a principles of anesthesia for victims with blunt and penetrating injuries. Um, I will try to give you a, 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 a just a very brief information what actually we are doing right now here in St. Louis in our trauma center. And I am hoping that it, you may get some kind of you know insight and just have uh, compared what you are doing over there and what we are doing here. And uh, even though it's pretty much impossible for me to imagine uh, the current situation in Ukraine, I hope you will find something um, helpful uh, that might uh, change or give some uh, insight about our practice. So as Andre stated, I'm originally from Turkey right now, living in the States. And uh, our all hearts and souls are with the people of Ukraine. I hope this conflict will finish very soon. So St. Louis is, uh, as, as, as Andre stated, is the state locates in the heart of the United States. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it is not just uh, this uh, famous arc, which is the tallest uh, monument, man-made monument in states. But it's also very famous with, with the gunshot violence, the trauma patients, and um, the, the 
violent uh, trauma for capita ratio in the United States and also in the Western world. So we are famous about that thing. So uh, I would like to start uh, just sharing some information uh, about uh, how we handle the patient as we learn a trauma is coming into the ED because it is not, we are not just an anesthesiologist, but we are the perioperative uh, uh, physicians which provide perioperative care to the patients. So um, let's get started with some certain facts. We know that trauma is the one of the most leading cause in all age groups, and it's the leading uh, uh, cause of death in the first four decades. And as we know, the severe trauma is a major global uh, public health issue, contributing almost uh, one tenth of the mortalities among like five and a half or 5.8 million people all around the world. And uh, WHO um, says that road traffic accidents, suicides, and homicides are the three leading causes of injury and, of course, violence related deaths. The important part for having a, a designated trauma center is that the likelihood of uh, having a mortality and morbidity is significantly lower if you are treated if you are treated in a trauma center as you have a severe traumatic injury. So, a designated trauma center makes a lot of difference. So, in WashU, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, they say we, we say WashU. I'm sorry, we have a dedicated trauma center which is called Charles F. Knight Emergency and Trauma Center, which is one of the biggest trauma centers, not only in the Midwest, but also among the uh, uh, nation. So this is the main entrance of our trauma center. And the, the thing is, our ORs is actually just located, uh, not immediately on top of it, but just on the right-hand side, the second floor. So we are very close in, in touch with the trauma center. So we uh, take care almost like uh, 15,000 trauma patients per year and the survival rate is 99%, but you know, not all the trauma patients are in really severe critical uh, situation. But as I said, like 3000 is like level ones, uh, which needs immediate care. So as I said, it's the busiest, one of the busiest trauma centers in the nation. So key elements of the level one trauma center includes having some kind of uh, infrastructure plus some well-educated, trained, and skilled uh, physicians and uh, organizations. So we have a 24-hour based general surgeon, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, anesthesiologists, mostly doing the trauma anesthesiologists, stays the entire night here and also the day. Emergency medicine specialists, of course, radiologists who are very much well trained about the trauma patients and also the interventional radiology, field of interventional radiology. Of course, internal special specialists and critical care specialists. And we also have a direct access to the cardiologists and then microvascular surgeons. So the level one trauma centers provide a huge, very important leadership in prevention of the, the traumas. So we do some uh, lectures, some uh, social events. We do public education. We do continuous uh, education for trauma team members. And our program is always under assessment for quality. So we always keep ourselves in good shape. So, um, most causes of the mortality due, due to trauma is that hemorrhage, of course, and multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, and of course, eventually the cardiopulmonary arrest. The most important part for the trauma patients is that the things that you can prevent, the things that lead morbidity that you can easily prevent. So we are very much concerned and we are much focused on unintended extubations, uh, technical surgical failures and missed injuries. So we are just extensively uh, review all the patients in all means and intravascular catheter related complications. So ideally the information uh, is starting flow from the EMS services as they uh, take the patient from the field, they provide us an age, gender, mechanism of injury, uh, some short information about the vital signs and apparent injuries 
Um, they also provide whether the patient is intubated or not. So we know before the patient comes in and we all get together because everybody has in this ACCS team uh, has a pager. So we get, go downstairs to the emergency department and we start waiting the patient. So the early notification is important to notify additional persons, additional staff, additional resources in case it's needed. And uh, also prepare the blood transfusion. If you know that there's a patient coming in a bleeding situation, you need to have blood immediately. So you can see that uh, on the left column, that mechanisms of injury, <coughs> excuse me, there are some several different types of uh, injuries. And uh, for instance, steering wheel damage, most, most of the time, and that's what, what we almost all the time have, unstrained patients and for instance, thoracic injuries. This kind of info gives you a kind of an insight before you see the patient, okay, what kind of a figure we have and what kind of a patient we are going to have in a couple of minutes. And they also inform us about the ETA, uh, the estimate time of arrival, which is also super important. So the initial assessment of a trauma patient uh, starts by just asking the patients or just by evaluating the patient's consciousness. So just ask a simple question. What's your name? How are you doing? This kind of thing. If, if you receive a kind of a clear, accurate response, all right, so the patient is phonating, uh, protecting the airway, and give you a kind of a nice impression that everything will go fine. And you should also observe the face, neck, chest, abdomen, the respiratory difficulty, any kind of tachypnea accessory, asymmetric muscle use, this kind of things. Actually, we don't intentionally do this, but it's like our sixth sense. It's our genes, you know, after having many years in the practice, you, you just immediately ask, you start observing it, your eyes just evaluate the patient, you immediately start touching the patient, inspecting uh, the oropharyngeal cavity, just seeing the chest, uh, palpating the, 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 uh, the extremities, the abdomen, looking for some hemorrhage, crepitus, swellings, or this kind of signs of injury. So actually, uh, this is something we do very easily. Um, on top of it, there's, there's something we call lemon. And uh, in consciousness patients, you should also initially do the airway assessment. As you are the anesthesiologist, actually, we are the experts for the airway management. So we always look the face and neck injuries, we evaluate uh, 332 rule. I will show the uh, slide for that one. Of course, if it's possible, if the patient is complying, you can check the Malampeda score and just see whether there's a, a kind of an obstruction, obesity, which may lead to difficult um, airway issues. And of course, neck mobility. Um, there's always a huge concern about the uh, stabilization of the neck with some color and other stuff. That's fine. That's, that's what we have to do. But don't forget that the risk of neurological injury from hypoxemia is much more greater than the risk of spine, uh, spinal injury due to a neck extension during the intubation. Don't misunderstand my words. I'm not saying that do the extensive extension or something, but creating, having a nice, easy intubation is very important. So you should a little bit uh, force the conditions, I guess. And you can see the 332 rule, three fingers, for mouth opening, three fingers uh, for distance between the mentum and uh, mandible of uh, neck and mandible junction. And of course, <clears throat> two fingers for the space between the superior notch and of the trade cartilage and the neck mandible junction. So <coughs> after this initial assess assessment, we also do an A, B, C, D, E approach. This is the same thing that the ERC, European Registration Council's first uh, assessment thing. It's all universal. Assess the airway, check the breathing, ventilation, circulation assessment, control the hemorrhage, do some bandages, do some tourniquets in case, uh, maintain adequate end organ perfusion if possible, even in the ED. Uh, disability assessments, just check any kind of neurological evaluation, any bleeding stuff, any uh, major broken extremities or something, and do the exposure. You know, exposure is also just check the possible injuries. So after doing this initial uh, assessment, there 
you might need some uh, bedside tools, especially for the airway management. And for the anesthesiologist, this is a very simple uh, lineup. You know, we need some suctioning bag, uh, valve mask attachment with high flow of oxygen, oral nasal airways, and so, so, so. But nowadays, the most important, um, actually, the tool we are using is the video laryngoscopes. Um, for many years, uh, the video laryngoscopes uh, were in, have, been in, uh, have been introduced our clinical practice, and uh, they are really helpful, especially with the patients who have already have a color on it, and uh, you don't even have to do any kind of extension and stuff. And there are very different options for the video laryngoscopes: cheap, super expensive, whatever. And we have different kind of uh, video laryngoscope sets. They're really helpful. I strongly recommend to have at least one in the ED that really is a game changer. So as Master Yoda uh, states, there are some golden tips about intubation. Actually, there are no golden tips. Let's, let, let me show you. So let's think about like that. You have a patient. So think about that. Is there a failure of airway maintenance or protection? If the answer is yes, no doubt, just go for the, go with the intubation. If no, I mean, no comes with a kind of a gray zone. And most of the time, we again end up with the intubation. So almost all the uh, level of one major trauma patients here in WashU receives a, an intubation because we really uh, don't want to deal with aspirations. We really want good oxygenation. We really want uh, to see um, how the patient's uh, condition will improve with, uh, with a good mechanical ventilation. So I'm not saying that everybody needs intubation, but almost all the patients have a tube uh, placed in. So um, always think about that uh, while you are trying to set up the airway, there, there might be a maxillofacial injuries, burns, blunt penetrating, neck injuries, compression of the airway, cervical instability. Oh, it's like a nightmare, right? Uh, the trauma patients is a nightmare for the airway management. But to be honest, my personal experience, um, almost all the patients uh, receive considerably um, um, acceptable intubation conditions in the ED, especially with the help of the video laryngoscopes. I, again, boldly underline the uh, importance of the video laryngoscopes uh, for the management of the airway patients, a, the trauma patients uh, who need an airway management. As you can see, there are different um, uh, problems with, for instance, maxillofacial trauma, which needs a more extensive evaluation. As an anesthesiologist, most of the time we don't, we do not involve the airway management in the ED because the uh, emergency uh, medicine specialists and their fellows and their residents are super enthusiastic to do that. But we always stand aside, just check what they are doing. And in case we believe that they need a hand without any uh, discussion or something, we take the role and then uh, manage the airway uh, as a uh, specialist in the business. Don't forget that there's always a possibility of having an emergency cricotroidotomy. So even though I have to say that I never ever done uh, one before in my life uh, in the last at least five years, because we are always good with the video laryngoscopes and with the direct laryngoscopes, but uh, it, it, it gets started with uh, primary palpation of the cricotroid membrane. Then we do a vertical incision, and then we reposition ourselves. They do a step incision horizontally to the cricotroid membrane and <clears throat> facilitate the introducer, put the bougie in, and railroad the tracheal tube over the introducer. And uh, so then we take the introducer out and we restore the airway. So don't forget that this is an invasive airway issue. So it, we need to have a joint decision that we need this thing. So it is pretty much, as I said, unlikely, but it is possible. So we have to know how to do it. 
So it's, a, as I said, a surgical airway, need a joint decision, the anesthesiologist and the ED clinicians and the trauma surgeon should involve this decision-making process. All right, <clears throat> as we establish the airway, we should avoid the hyperoxemia. You know, in, it's a high adrenaline situation. People are in huge, I can't say panic, but everybody's trying to do something. So you can easily go up to like a one point of, you know, 100% of oxygen, try to give as much as oxygen, but it's not good all the, almost all the time. So if possible, please monitorize the, with the pulse oximeter. I guess it's pretty much okay with everyone. And if possible, do the arterial blood gas analysis. And we are all just good with the SpO2 over 95, 92% and a partial oxygen pressure of like 65 millimeters mercury is just good. We don't need more. So there's a very limited ev evidence that suggesting high ben uh, benefits of high fraction of oxygen. So let's don't do that. Um, so what we immediately do as the patient comes to the ED, we try to put an intra-arterial catheter. If, if the patient is not running up to the um, OR, we'd also try to put a central venous catheter. It might be through the groin or from the internal jugular vein, according to the type of the trauma and the availability of the Side, you can uh, come. You can, you can change from femoral to central. I mean, I mean uh, to the neck or subclavian. It's truly up to you. But don't forget that even if you have two large bore peripheral IVs, that's still very much okay. You don't have to push yourself for a central line. So just put as big as possible, like one or two uh, 16 or 18 gauge catheters. That will really create a good initial administration of fluids. You can easily run blood transfusions over there. You can easily run an IV vasoactive agent. And you can also give some propofol or ketamine or etomidate upon the patient's current situation. But <clears throat> while doing the, the, these things, please do not delay the emergency surgical intervention. If the patient needs a very emergent surgical intervention, you have to go immediately up to the OR. And of course, introsis access is always a rapid and reliable access. So if we just come to the management of general anesthesia, I have to say that uh, whenever the patient comes and whenever the lines are uh, placed, intubated, and we believe that uh, there's a, um, a kind of a bleeding or the, f the, the fastest positive, or we almost immediately we can scan the patient from uh, head to toe. And uh, if we know that there's something bleeding inside the abdomen, we immediately go up to the OR. So you may say that, okay, in, for instance, this is noontime right now here. If we don't have an available room, actually you should have an available room always ready for a trauma patient if you have a trauma center. So on your right, actually here, you can see a general impression of our uh, famous 212 room in second floor, number 12 room. And you can see that it is all set up. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just trying to recover an upper respiratory infection. I'm sorry about that. So this room is always ready for trauma. And you can see that even the video laryngoscopes, the anesthesia machine and the patient, the data management system is all ready switched on and it stays like this. And you can see that rapid infusion system and the external heating system, and even the bags are all ready. So the time um, as the patient gets into this room to the induction is less than a couple of minutes. So immediately we can induce this patient and get started. And you can see that we have at least one ultrasound dedicated for the anesthesia team. You can see some calcium and epinephrine shots almost ready to go. And as, as I said, you can see the pixels, the, the thing for the medications all switch on. And the, even the patient management system is also switched on. So we don't lose time for this. Also, we have some fiber optics available in case, not for the intubation. We are not recommending uh, fiber optic intubation as the first choice. It's not good for trauma patients but just doing some kind of, you know, uh, 
through the tube, see how the airway is and just check. And so the surgical team has their endoscopes, colonoscopy devices. And you can see that the central lines are almost ready to open up and just go. And you can see that there's another ultrasound just for the convenience of the surgical team. So you have to have this kind of an environment in case you have the patient immediately up to the uh, ORs. So the goal of induction or the general anesthesia is to produce an unconscious state while maintaining adequate organ perfusion. This is very important, the maintaining adequate organ perfusion. It is easy to say, hard to achieve, but that's the goal. So please avoid any profound hypertension, hemodynamic instability. So you may consider starting vasopressors just before induction or even at the ED with a, a, a small bolus of norepinephrine or infusion of norepi, or even if you, it's available, just go with the vasopressin. I intentionally not providing any dosages because I don't believe that it's necessary. It's very easy to access. And uh, so I'm not providing any uh, specifics, but just consider giving some vasoactive medications. Of course, trauma patients comes with, if still not intubated in the ED, comes with a rapid sequence anesthesia induction. So we need a hypnotic component of uh, a rapid sequence anesthesia induction. And there are a lot of thousands of different papers about use of ketamine, etomidate. The differences the, here in WashU, we always go with ketamine in the first choice uh, and combine it with adjuncts I will talk about. But almost all the time, we avoid propofol because of the propofol's negative systemic vascular effects, creating hypertension. This is the last thing we want in a trauma patient. So just avoid propofol, think about ketamine or etomidate and just go for it. So we need a muscle relaxant, of course, to facilitate the anesthesia, uh, I mean, the intubation. So SOX is the most popular agent here in States, but you can even go with rock chromium. So you should go with the ED, uh, three times of ED, 95 doses. It's like succinylcholine for one mg per kilo for rock chromium around one to 1.2 mg per kilo. And uh, most of the, the both combination provides excellent intubation conditions. And we always put some adjuncts. Uh, Lido is our favorite here in WashU. And we also give some midazolam. I will talk about that later on I also. It creates some amnesia. It's good. It, it has absolutely no hemodynamic effects. And you may also consider giving some low-dose fentanyl or even remifentanyl uh, just for the uh, facilitating the anesthesia induction. <clears throat> for the maintenance, <clears throat> of course, volatile inhalation anesthetics is the most charming uh, part because we, again, would like to avoid propofol. And it's his first line choice for maintenance. The advantage is that it's easy to administrate. You just switch it on. That's it. And however, uh, there are also some disadvantages, but let's talk about advantages first. So it reliably blockades the response to the sensory input, creates a kind of a bronchodilation, which is fine. And those dependent increases, decreases in skeletal and smooth muscle tone, even though we are never shy giving some muscle relaxants. Actually, muscle relaxants, almost the newer muscle relaxants has no hemodynamic effects. So you can go with rock chromium without any doubt. But it also provides, as I said, the inhalation is a skeletal or smooth muscle tone decreases. So, and you can easily monitorize the depth of anesthesia with the entitled anesthesia uh, agent concentration with, without any extra cost or something. Anytime you can put this on, but I don't believe that it is super necessary. The disadvantages are, of course, there are uh, several disadvantages. Those dependent suppression of airway reflexes, respiratory depression, some myocardial depression. It's not our major concern, but post-operative nausea and vomiting is also, <coughs> excuse me, an issue. So please consider uh, low concentrations. We don't want to suppress the patient's hemodynamic too much. Entide, as I stated, entitled agent content concentration is important. Let's monitorize it. If you have capability to do the dismonitorization, you are very welcome. That's great. Uh, and try to um, uh, consider the agents with low blood gas par partition coefficients for rapid set in, rapid set out. Thing. 
But definitely avoid nitrous. We don't want nitrous oxide and we never switched on. And it is because it expands all the gas spaces and especially in traumatic brain uh, injuries, we don't like it because it increases cerebral metabolic rate and pulmonary, it also increases pulmonary vascular resistance. So there's actually no need for nitrous and there's just avoid it, don't use that. Um, you may also use some kind of high opioid supplementation. It is a little bit tricky or gray zone. As long as you have a nice blood pressure, so not all the trauma patients are dying to be actually. actually. Some guys have um, more or less considerably good uh, blood pressure. So you may go with uh, some kind of opioid uh, support anesthesia. And fentanyl, uh, not as very solid evidence, but uh, we think that it's beneficial for dilation of the microcirculation and has a minimal myocardial depressant effect. So don't forget to have a close monitoring on the hemodynamic profile. These fentanyl doses are a little bit on the higher side. We don't use this much high, but you can go up to uh, two or three, uh, maybe even four mix per kilo uh, of fentanyl in a, you know, a considerably a normal uh, BMI patient. So upon to your uh, preference, it might be hydromorphone or methadone. It's not a big deal. So temperature management is super important. We have to avoid hypothermia. So sometimes you open up the chest, you open up the abdomen according to trauma. So the hypothermia is a big problem. So it unfortunately creates a sympathetic stimulation, increased myocardial oxygen consumption, uh, myocardial ischemia, coagulopathy, which is a big problem I will talk about uh, in a couple of slides, increases the mortality. So we should keep the temperature up over 25.5 with active warming devices and warming the fluids and also, of course, the blood products. I showed you the rapid infusion system, which also provides a nice warm blood products to the patient. This is very important and key part of the uh, trauma uh, practice. So uh, the other thing is a lung protective ventilation. We don't need to achieve high, huge uh, tidal volume. So let's keep it low to six to eight milliliters. Let's keep it a little bit on the permissive hypercapnia side, but uh, always keep in mind, uh, it will also create some kind of acidosis. So it's a kind of a balance, but definitely please, please avoid PEEP unless it is super necessary because it decreases the preload, the venous return, and it decreases the cardiac output. That's the last thing we want in a trauma patient. All right. So most of the time, these patients are in hemorrhagic shock. So it's a very simple thing. You may find different algorithms to assess how severe it is. But to be honest, you don't have time most of the time to do this, you know, calculations. Just think about like this. Any hypotensive patient who does not respond to a fluid bolus has a hemorrhagic cause and will likely require blood products. This is very important. So give a, like a liter of saline or uh, a kind of a crystalloid, and if the patient is still tachycardic and the patient is still hypotensive, even though you can't see any bleeding spot, there might be a kind of an intra-abdominal bleeding, intra-thoracic bleeding, bleeding. The patient is bleeding to the pelvis or something, so needs a blood product. So what we do is a damage control resuscitation. So we are trying to control the damage. You cannot control the damage by just giving blood products. You need an early surgical control of hemorrhage. Surgical control is the goal. You cannot catch a, a, um, a bleeding source with just by giving blood products. However, we keep the blood pressure a little bit on the low side, uh, especially the maps around 50 to 65. If the patient is young and you believe that the patient don't have any cardiac issues, you may even keep it below the 50s. So it is good to give your surgical friends a chance uh, with, with the low blood pressures that uh, the bleeding will be a little bit less. So uh, there are some easy ways to assess the uh, the fluid uh, need of the patient. As you can see that this Frank Sterling uh, relationship, you know, <coughs> with preload and the stroke volume, here in the steeper side, whenever you start giving some more volume, 
there will be more stroke volume. So there's a good response. You can see that the waves goes up and down, up and down. And here, actually, whenever you are you loaded the patient, even if you give some more preload, there will be this the change in the stroke volume is super limited. So almost all the more modern anesthesia machines calculate the PPV, the, the and it gives us an impression that it is just giving, it's just making the ratio between the maximum uh, amplitude and with the minimum amplitude under mechanical ventilations as positive pressure ventilation with the intrathoracic passage increases as um, if the patient has a hypovolemic state, there will be huge variation between the uh, arterial uh, line waveform. So we calculate and we say that if the PPV is high, so let's keep some more fluid or the blood products. This is a very easy way to do it. So, well, if you have some capabilities of doing T, it's the ideal thing. On the left, you can see that a normal volumic, a nice cavity with loaded with volume. On the right, there's actually no cavity at all because the patient is hypervolumic. Okay, so keep on, let's talk about a hemorrhagic shock. And <coughs> this is something we call a massive transfusion protocol. This is very in, uh, important. Even the medical students here in Washington knows what, and what an MTP is. If someone is screaming for MTP, oh, okay, we're in trouble. We need some extra hands. So the extra hands comes from the blood bank. And I'm super appreciative about our blood bank. It's an excellent blood bank, just supporting us in all means. So it's activated by an attending physician. It might be a, a trauma or standard MTP. I will mention it in the next slide. We provide the patient name, identification number, and gender, and the current location. And always, also we have... Uh, two uh, blood products in the ED uh, fridge that we can immediately give the patient before we receive the MTP. So if it's a trauma MTP, we go with six units of all positive LTWB. And if it's a standard MTP, it's not a trauma MTP, but the patient is bleeding. So we got with that uh, 10 units of uh, packed red blood cells, six FFPs, and one unit of single donor platelets. So in the first cycle, as I said, um, it is a trauma MTP. I, I give you the description. Whenever you finish this thing, you go with the second cycle. So the blood bank gives you an a, a info whenever the second cycle is ready. It's almost all the time before you finish the giving the blood products. So you say that, okay, I need the second cycle. You can actually imagine or you can actually predict that you will need the second cycle and just inform. But even if you have trauma or the standard MTP cycles, the second cycles come as a standard MTP. So six red, uh, packed red blood cells, FFPs, and a, a single donor platelet. So the ratio is one, 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 you know, the, the ratio of red blood cells and FFP and the one platelet. And the third cycle, if you need the third cycle, and I can tell you that we, we go even like 10th cycle or something sometimes. So it's a the same standard MTP, but this time you may have some period precipitates or factor sevens. So the control of uh, coagulopathy, unfortunately, is one of the most important part of the trauma anesthesia. And I would like to talk about the point of care, bedside uh, test, which is a uh, thrombelastogram or ROTEM. It's just more or less the same thing. The best part is it is fast, reliable, and reproducible test, so you can use it as a, yeah, I mean, um, just to check how you are performing. So um, let me put my glasses. Okay, so thrombelastogram just gets starts here, and there's a reaction time which we have the coagulation pathways involved. This is what we call R, and it's the clot time, and it's the uh, generation of the fibrin formation. And then we will immediately have two legs going up and down. It is actually the fibrin uh, and the platelets uh, getting involved with the coagulation pathways and platelets. And if this alpha ang angle is steeper, it is good. If it is like, like a, bot a bottle, it's not good. So we achieve a maximum, maximum altitude, or we call maximum strength. And eventually, after a period of time, which we say 30 minutes, there will be a kind of a fibrinolysis. So this is a normal uh, thromboelastogram. However, uh, the, this is actually a, another, um, I mean, um, uh, a slide for that. 
And here, after we achieve a maximum amplitude, there will actually a, a fiber node leases. Okay. So on the left, you can see that there's a primary hyperfiber node leases, which whenever we achieve a kind of maximum amplitude, actually in this case, there's not a, a, a maximum amplitude, there will immediate fiber node leases, which is not good, creates a lot of bleeding. And on top of it, if it is normal, this is a secondary fibrinol disease, we have a maximum amplitude, and then we eventually have a fibrinol disease, which is good, which is normal. So what? how can we uh, avoid this? So transexamic acid, TXA, is, even though it's controversial for trauma patients, it's a part of a mass of trans transfusion protocols among US hospitals, and it is time dependent. So you should think and just administer TXA whenever you feel that there's a hyperfibrinolysis, uh, active hemorrhage, if TEG or Rotem is unavailable. So if you have an active hemorrhage, you, even though you don't have TEG or Rotem, you can even go with TSA. So the dose is one gram for 10 minutes and then follow with another gram in eight hours. But uh, for the current military guidelines here in States, we recommend two grams TSA IV immediately and one gram infusion for over eight hours. You can also consider giving some fibrinogen supplements, curiopricipate, low fibrinogen levels, or, or strongly suspected patients may improve the outcome by just giving some curiopricipate. That's why in the third cycle, we have, uh, we have a chance of decision making of doing cryo cryopricipate or something. So according to the European guidelines, if um, we want to have a target fibrinogen concentration of 150 to 200. Okay, uh, prothrombin complex concentrate, this is what we can do also here, but it is super expensive. So we are a little bit on the shy side. Uh, there's also a conflicted data should be used with the, especially with the guidance of the ROTEM. So you need the solid evidence. <laughs> Okay, the last slide is actually uh, for the postoperative care. Actually, this postoperative care is pretty much standard. We never uh, extubate the patient. We always keep the patient intubated. There are several reasons for that. If the thing is, almost all the time, the abdomen is left open uh, because just in order to avoid the compartment syndrome, and um, there are a lot of fluid shifts, you know, hypothermia and this kind of things. There's no reason to extubate these patients. So we keep the patients intubated and we do a full ICU monitorization. And the very important thing is just you have to perform a complex detail, but most important, we have a very structurized handoff after the anesthesia uh, maintenance while you are handing this patient to the intensive care. You should, you should uh, talk about the uh, airway, you should talk about the patient's current status, possible injuries, the surgical intervention. Also, the, uh, the surgical colleagues also contribute to the handoff, so they also provide more or less their info. So um, we, you should give a, a, a ballpark, ballpark figure for the uh, intensivists uh, about the current situation of the patient. And you should also provide some contact information in case your um, extra info is needed. So always keep in mind that you should treat the, the hypothermia and also always keep your eyes on the, especially uh, reoccurrence of bleeding in the post period. There's a high possibility that this patient will come back downstairs to the OR as a secondary bleeding or another issue or something. Uh, I would like to, thank all of you for your attendance. Um, I may go into more details with your questions if you want. And I'm once again, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share our, you know, a kindly uh, experience, let's say, with you. And we all, nowadays we stand with Ukraine. I hope everything will settle down very quickly. Thank you so much. Zach, thank you very much for a, a lovely lecture. I uh, had a pleasure listening to you. Um, we have quite a few questions already from from the audience, um, and I also have some something else to ask you. Uh, but I think the first question came, which you kind of partly 
um, partly um, answered already, but and the listeners would like to know what is your experience with a tranexamic acid with the TXA, um, particularly in trauma patients, and what is your preferred dose? Yeah, I, I have actually, yeah, yeah uh, I got it. Okay, actually, that's that's what we exactly do. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a standard uh, protocol, and it's a very popular thing here in states, uh, not only for trauma patients but also for the patients who undergo some hip and knee replacements and a kind of uh, lengthy uh, orthotrauma patients. I mean, not acute, but have some kind of, you know, uh, broken extremities and just undergoing a kind of a semi-elective repair. So, uh, yeah, we're extensively using TXA. And um, to be honest, we believe that it's effective. Uh, this is like, you know, just avoiding a, a possible complication. and. To be honest, even though I propagated a lot for the uh, Rotem and uh, Tromba Elastograph, it is even uh, super hard to access all the time here in WashU because we have limited amount of uh, you know machines that you can run. Of course, if you believe that uh, the patient is having a, a primary hyperfibrinolysis, you can immediately go with it. But uh, sometimes it is really hard. To be honest, and it's costly. So just to avoid this thing, as I stated, if you believe that the, the patient may have a kind of you know a, a, a fluid shift, a blood loss in a kind of a surgical thing, it can be a trauma or like a hip replacement or a knee is not that much bad, but hip is you know it's, it bleeds. So you may definitely go with a TXA uh, with like a one gram in uh, like 10, 15 minutes, and then. You may uh, do the infusion or just do another one gram at, in eight hours. And I would like to also, again, underline, even though it was in the slides, uh, you may go even up uh, in a major trauma patient, like a, a war victim or just a, uh, something like that, with like two grams. Brilliant. Zach, thank you very much. I would like to bring Oleg into this discussion because, okay. as far as I know, Oleg's uh, one of his scientific interests is in. Uh, hemostasis and uh, he may have a, an opinion on uh, on tranexamic acid itself and particularly on the tranexamic acid in trauma victims please thank you thank you very much dear andre uh, dear professor alan Ogle, thank you very much for your brilliant lectures it's really very necessary for us and very important i think that the uh, that uh, tranexamic acid should be present at all uh, stage uh, of the treatment of combat trauma uh, patients, especially when we have bleeding, uh, the first dose, uh, dose may be uh, maybe uh, one gram, but already within within the first hour you can enter another one gram. Uh, for the last uh, maybe bleeding. We can uh, we can enter uh, maybe four uh, gram daily, uh, and uh, maybe please do not uh, be afraid uh, of thrombotic uh, thrombotic complications, dear friends. Yes, thank you. The problem is bleeding, so actually you shouldn't be as uh, Dr. Tarabin uh, already uh, stated. There's no reason to be afraid of uh, of having some kind of clot issues and other stuff because the, the patient is bleeding. So you have to stop it. You know, you have to stop the bleeding with all means you have. Great. Okay. I, I agree I'm, with you. I'm okay. seeing another question as a sort of an aftermath of a uh, question on tranexamic acid. Tranexamic acid. Uh, another listener is asking, do you begin tranexamic acid practice during transfer or is it the patient expected to enter the hospital? When do you give it first? Oh, wow. that's that's a great, brilliant question. Um, I don't believe that uh, the paramedics, you know, in states we don't have physicians in the ambulance system. Actually, the paramedics bring the patient in, but they are really experienced. They are very good at airway management. They are very good at assessing the patient. We are super happy with their, you know, service, and they are perfectly fine. And I don't believe, even though I'm not quite positive, but I don't really believe, I never saw any patient receive T TXA on the transfer. But don't forget that um, the time uh, 
from the field to our trauma center is super limited. You know, San Luis is not a crazy big city. It's like one and a half million. I mean, uh, you can easily access to 20, 25 minutes, even the rush hour. On top of it, uh, we also receive a lot of patients who have airlifted because in the you know rural areas, as in, you know, southern Illinois, rural parts of Missouri, uh, North Arkansas, North Oklahoma, you know, no problem. We have we receive like 400 miles uh, radius. I mean, uh, patients. So. Uh, maybe those patients airlifted may receive some TXA, but I don't believe that in the ambulance they are administering a TXA. And I don't believe that we also do it in the ED. Whenever we receive the patient to the OR, we, we do it. Okay. We, yeah. Yeah. A TXA is obviously helpful, but uh, on the yeah. battlefield, uh, enduring transfer, uh, one should really concentrate on stopping the bleeding, really, isn't it? With the turning case. Andre. The, the problem, even though I'm I'm not a crazy you know hemostasis guy, I I have a very limited in, you know info as an anesthesiologist. But the, the problems get started is when you when you start giving some blood products and when you start the surgery itself. So because if the patient is bleeding, of course there are some clot formation, but it is just you are just losing the whole blood. Yeah. So, uh, almost all the time uh, you have a more or less a nice. Uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit because you're just losing it immediately. So, um, so I guess it is, you know, the timing might be okay uh, as the patient comes up to the OR. And if it's a major trauma, major bleeding, the time the patients come into the ED and goes up to the OR is less than 10 minutes. Okay. So, let's switch, let's switch yes. the topic. Let's leave the yes. TXA because yes. the questions keep coming. Um, sure. yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, another question is about the use of ketamine. They, people are asking, is ketamine your first choice? And I would yeah. like to add, if it is, then what are the, what are the <clears throat> negative effects of ketamine? Are there any yeah. negative effects? Of course, you know, ketamine is a, actually a, a brilliant, nice medication for trauma patients, as long as the timing is important. If it's a, a little bit, you know, uh, timely trauma, as we all know, the pharmacology properties of the ketamine, it provides some sympathetic discharge. And if you have, if you just unloaded all your sympathetic, um, you know, uh, backup, so ketamine will immediately provide a huge cardiovascular depression. However, we try to do a kind of a balanced anesthesia induction with adjuvants, as I mentioned, Lido, some kind of very low dose opioids. Remy, maybe a little bit fentanyl, but ketamine, uh, almost all the patients receive like a one mg per kilo ketamine if we believe that the, the, the systemic response is still alive. But anytime you can go with the atomidate. And the, the, the data or the, the evidence is not going from one part to another. Nobody's saying that ketamine is better than atomidate or atomidate is better than ketamine. But uh, I know it's needless to say, but just avoid propofol. If the patient is super stable and you have a positive fast and just the surgeon says that, okay, let's check the abdomen and the patient is, you know, talking to you, GSS is fine. You may go, but there's no reason to use actually propofol. Yeah. Uh, so just avoid I it. agree. And the one, one agent that is not good, well, another one that is still used elsewhere in the world is thiopentin. As we yes. know, thiopentin yeah, might, might be a not not yeah. good at all for, yeah, for, absolutely. for all these reasons. As, as you know, the, there's more people being killed in Pearl Harbor with thiopentin than with the Japanese yeah. aviation. Um, the, the next question is about uh, atomidate. People are asking, what are the peculiarities of uh, using atomidate in critical trauma patients? Well, of course, it's the, it's, it provides an excellent hemodynamic uh, stability, but our major concern is the suprarenal you know, suppression. And it's amazing to say that uh, the first paper published about the, uh, the relation between the atomidate and the suppression is from Washu in 19... Uh, 70 something or 80 something with Dr. White, Paul White, who's a famous anesthesiologist. Cortisol and levels, yeah. It is the, it's, it's actually here just first described this thing. So, so that's why we are a little bit distant to atomidate. And actually, we are very 
easy to, easy go with the ketamine. Now we also use ketamine for the daily patients who who need some kind of analgesia, who need some kind of and and is unfortunately is a very well known city of people having a lot of things in their bloodstream. You understand what I mean? Yeah. So ketamine is also good for this kind of patient. So we are very much uh, familiar with the use of ketamine. So that might be the main reason we're using ketamine. Thank you, thank you, Zach. I think we pretty much established that the ketamine is yeah. the is the preferred choice for any patient yeah. with trauma, yeah. or bleeding, as long as you know, absolutely, as long as you not overdo the dose. And the yes. dose we know yes. is about one to two, uh, depending on. We go with like one mg per kilo on the lower side. Uh, milligram per, per kilogram. Yeah. Um, the next question is somebody's asking why bronchoscopy for intubation is not recommended for trauma. Oh, I, I guess I missed uh, emphasize it. I'm, I'm saying that we are not recommending fiber optic intubation. It's my fault, maybe. So please forgive me if I give them the wrong impression. So fiber optic intubations, we are not recommending for the uh, Unless it is super necessary, of course, and unless the patient is super stable and have some major upper respiratory issues that or airway issues that you need, but almost all the time the video laryngoscopes fulfill those you know gap between the direct laryngoscopy and need some kind of an extra uh, help of a, a video stuff. So uh, the the bronchoscopes, the, the disposable bronchoscopes for arrow, I guess that I, I uh, show you is that um, they are good for everything. But we most almost all the time we just check it for uh, when we need a, a double lumen intubations and when we need uh, to check the airway if there is a combustion or kind of a uh, you know a fire hazard or something in the patient, uh, but not for the intubations not for the intubations. Yeah, uh, I mean, unless you, I mean, I do a lot of fiber optic intubations uh, during of my uh, list for max fax and ENT, and unless you are very slick at it, it's not a very quick procedure. Um, you, might, yeah. you might though use the fiber optic scope as a combined, um, combined technique when you're using video ringoscope and you basically use your fiber optic scope with a yes. second lenicities, who would use that basically as a bougie to help to get the tube under the hyperangulated blade, but that requires two two people. That's the pretty much I would say the use in the emergency situation of fiber optic endoscopy. Okay, uh, let's let's move on. Uh, somebody is asking about this in in critical trauma. How would you how would you class the usefulness of this in critical patients in trauma patients? Well, uh, Andre, I can tell you that. If it's available and if you know uh, if you can use it, just go for it. Otherwise, I am quite positive that just monitorizing the entitled agent concentration and just checking the age and uh, weight uh, adjust um, MAC calculation, MAC measurements of the anesthesia device, that should be fine. And, and another interesting thing is um, our department head is Dr. Avidan is the uh, the one who showed actually the, the problems with the best and just also emphasized many years ago uh, the use of entitled agent concentrate here in St. Louis. So um, the, the first option best is expensive. I mean, at least has a cost, let's say. The other one is free of trap 10 pounds. It's about $15 per strip. Well, you know, sometimes cost is important. Yes. In states, maybe, but in Turkey, it is something. Yeah, yeah. In Ukraine, I, I don't want to comment because I don't know. But here in states, okay, you can use whatever you want. But uh, well, I'm not actually asking my all residents to put a best. But if if it's available, yes, go for it. It's not just go with the entitled agent concentration. I totally agree, Zach, and thank you very much. I think so. this is a brilliant question that somebody brought up. Yeah, because absolutely. A lot of studies, and I always quote, be aware study and be unaware study with massive amount of thousands and thousands of patients where it was shown that if you use BIS, yes, the incidence of awareness will be decreased, but if you just use inhalational agents with actually a more stable cardiovascular like sevoflurane, then the incidence of the awareness will be even lower and you will definitely absolutely absolutely 
Without um, any exhale page. You will definitely know where you are, how much is patient inhaling, how much they are exhaling. You will yeah. know exactly where you are. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move on. Uh, there is a question about um, a tamsilate uh, as an um, as a, uh, anti-hemorrhagic agent. Somebody is asking, is there a use of a tamsilate in critical trauma patients? Well, actually, we don't use it here in States, and I have very, very limited, even no experience. Maybe Dr. Tarabin has some experience. I I, I don't feel myself comfortable to co you know, just comment okay. this. Sure about that. Oleg, would you like to answer that question yes. about Tamsilate? Thank you. We are using this uh, medicine in our uh, practice too, and we really recommend it to this. Okay, what is what is your dose? How much do you use? About uh, about uh, uh, one one gram. One gram. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Um, then there is a question about antibiotics preoperatively for prophylaxis. Is there any need yep. for urgent antibiotics in trauma victims? Well, we 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 try to go at least uh, a one uh, you know uh, um, third generation cefalzolin and there. According to the you know the involvement of the uh, the intestine, you may even go uh, consider giving some kind of uh, coverage for anaerobics. Yes, definitely you need some antibiotics, absolutely. Because to be honest, especially a dying patient with a huge trauma, almost all the time you don't care. Even I I, I saw a lot of patients uh, just there. We are opening the chest in the ED with no kind of sepsis and sepsis, you know. Uh, criteria. So this patient definitely needs antibiotics. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Let's yeah. move on. There is one more question. Somebody is asking, um, what are your tips? What would be your tips for providing anesthesia in the war field? Yeah. You so, in not out of hospital. I mean, absolutely. So as we, as I, that's that's the main reason I get started from the field. You know, just the, the our EMS to inform. So the most important thing is control the bleeding. So in, we have a program called Stop Bleeding here in St. Louis. And because, as I said, we have many uh, gunshot victims and trauma victims. Uh, and the idea is just uh, try to stop bleeding by compressing it, doing some tourniquets with the, the tools you can easily access in the field. It might be your, you know, bow tie, your regular tie, or some, uh, you know, some shirts and other stuff. I know it is, it will, it will be challenging, but don't forget that it, it, performing a, a compression or just providing some kind of um, uh, tunicates will give you the opportunity to buy some time before you move to the. Uh, or, okay, in the field, as I said, ketamine might be still a good opportunity to, uh, in the field hospitals or in a very limited opportunities, uh, create a, a nice analgesia and kind of an anesthesia. And uh, the optimizing the airway and the oxygenization should be the utmost priority because this is a very easy thing you can handle without just a tube and the laryngoscope or even with a laryngeal mask you can yeah. you can even uh, very effectively ventilate the patient and of course uh, if you have a chance uh, having some you know there are some very port portable entitled carbon dioxide uh, sensors like this like a uh, how can i say um, smaller than a standard mouse or something that provides you uh, give you the impression about your uh, effectiveness or your chest compressions and uh, the the location of the tube also it's because the main it's the mainstream co2 monitor rather than the side stream. yeah yes absolutely yeah you're definitely right thank you andre andre that's it that's what i'm trying to say and don't forget that even in skilled hands the risk of uh, un, uh, accidental intub esophageal intubations are super high so, as I said, it's a high adrenaline situation. So, even if you auscultate, you may feel some kind of, uh, you know, uh, breath sounds, even though you don't have it. So, 
just be 100% sure that the tube is in the right place. And uh, because this is first thing first, very important. If you're not quite okay with that, and if you have a chance, you can anytime go with a super glot devices for a, a temporary airway management, and which will not harm the patient, but on the other hand, will really help the oxygenization and post pressure ventilation if it is well, you know, located in the supraglottic area, uh, space, whatever. So these are the things I may tell. And of course, whenever it's possible, it's best to transfer the patient to a, uh, a medical institute that uh, more can be done. Okay, thanks, Zach. One more question. Um, yeah. This one says, what about internal organ bleeding? We cannot stop that by tourniquets. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, maybe the thing you can do is just elevate the extremities just to increase the preload and uh, just give some fluids if it's possible. Try, try to set up some kind of IVs. If possible, I mean, it's e easy to say, hard to do. I understand that. Uh, for the internal bleedings, well, actually, there's not so much to do except bring the patient to the so a surgical center. There's a couple of things, uh, in my opinion, that one can do. Well, well, a couple of things about the internal bleeding. A, internal bleeding compared to external bleeding is going to stop at some point because the space is yeah, there. Ab absolutely, absolutely. It will, you know, localize itself, yeah. yes. Exactly. If it's the uh, retroperitoneal bleeding, so the space is even smaller. And then those of you who've seen somebody who have been delivered to the hospital with a triple A rupture, okay, it, it, and at some point they had a rupture of the abdominal aorta and a liter of blood came out of it. And then in it tamponade, isn't it? Yes. It stops because it has no more space to go to, uh, unlike the external bleed. So it will stop. So you will stabilize the patient. And the trick there is to not to overinfuse them, not to bring the blood pressure too high. Yeah, of course. To actually, course. you know, um, exaggerate the, the bleeding. And there are also uh, things like um, uh, compression trousers, which go over the abdomen. Again, for the pelvis, yes, we have that, those stuff that can be used, but in the field without any other aids. I mean, well, the, the other thing is, Andre, actually, you're definitely right. I'm totally in the same page with you. However, for the intra-abdominal thing, you know, the, the patient can bleed to death, you know, I mean, yeah. crazy, crazy. You know, I, 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 I can tell many different patients that whenever we open up the abdomen, the, it's like a volcano, you know, this, it's just going up and it's not, it's not the, uh, maybe, uh, how can I say, it's the, the, the bleeding already in the abdomen. So, um, it's a very unfortunate thing. I'm sorry, you know, just. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is when you're opening them, they are, they are almost always in the hospital, isn't it? Uh, of but course. Of course. You're never doing... No, no. There's no way that you can do it in the field. No. No, no way. You cannot open an abdomen. The only thing you can do is if you believe that there's a... Uh, I mean, pneumothorax, you can do a needle, uh, you know, puncture and just uh, release the tension. Thoracus and thesis, yes. Most, all the time do it. Yeah. And almost all the time, we even do the chest tubes in the in the uh, ED. You know, yes, cool. we don't do that. Okay, yeah. I don't see any more questions from the audience, but I have. Um, Andre, one, one last thing about this thing. I'm sorry, I just remembered. Yeah. We, even if we open the chest in the ED for internal uh, cardiac compressions, we never open the abdomen in the ED. Yes, because there's nothing you can do with an open up abdomen in the ED, you know, so we never do that because because of the same thing you mentioned, you know, it's just a little bit uh, localized its own uh, with, with the pressure, yes. Absolutely. Um, uh, so no more questions from the audience, but I have a couple of questions myself. Uh, you mentioned the inotropes, and I totally agree with you that uh, yeah. one should be ready with, I, I, I almost have, you know, two syringes in my hands, one with ketamine and one with something else. So yep. my question is, what is this something else that you would well, use? It can, <clears throat> it can be, well, most of the time we recommend norepi or vaso, vasopress. So Actually, that would be in the syringe pump? Yes, yes. Okay. We always have them ready in the shrink pump. Yeah, yeah. Always but, updated every single uh, eight or 12 hours. I'm not quite sure. The residents take care of that thing. Yeah. And uh, almost all the time, whenever the patient shows up, we immediately hook it up and then 
get started even if the patient is not intubated, then we're going to do the intubation or the induction. So if the patient is already intubated, we all get started, you know, without any doubt. Because yeah. um, these patients definitely need a kind of, uh, you know, inotropes. Uh, and then whenever they open up the abdomen and you realize that there's a huge bleeding or something, and if you are lucky enough, the patient is having a good hemodynamic profile, you may downsize it, but it is pretty much unlikely. Most of the time, patients need that. Yeah. But as I said, it's a damage control uh, surgery, damage, damage control uh, blood transfusion policy, so we don't want to overcorrect anything, Absolutely. In, especially the blood pressure. Absolutely. Uh, there is no doubt that the best iron drop is noradrenaline. Uh, in, in, in the acutely bleeding and traumatized patient. However, you know, it needs to be set up. It's pretty pow powerful. It needs usually central line to, to, to be administered yes. and so on. So our choice, for example, in this is actually metraminol. And metraminol, okay. if you wish, is like a mild noradrenaline. Yes. And it's yes. easy. You can, you can use it in a syringe. You can then set, put it up in the, in the pump, but it's just could be given just from your syringe. You know, we have a, Absolutely. a, a an ampule Absolutely. already pre-diluted uh, and so on. So metraminol. Yeah, we have the, we, we have, for instance, norepi as pre-diluted in a shrink form and also uh, like a prefix, uh, you know, ready to infuse yeah. form. So, uh, yeah, we, we go with most, most of the time with norepi. Or with, with are, you, are, you, are, you, are you happy if I ask you one more question? <laughs> of course, please, please. As long as I have the answer, no problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, when uh, I do ALS course, I'm ALS course director, and we always speak about intraosseous needles. What is your opinion about the intraosseous infusion? <laughs> well, um, I can tell you, you know, again, the St. Louis experience, we have uh, a lot of super obvious patients here, super obvious people here in the Midwest. We are famous about that. Yeah. Um, all right. Sometimes it is really hard to uh, set up a nice IV. So paramedics are not shy to put an um, uh, IO needles in, and it really works very well. But whenever the patient arrives to the ED and needs some extra, you know, stuff, uh, we also we almost all the time try to put a central line. But in interosseous, you know, needles are perfect. Perfect. Um, uh, plan B's or plan C's whenever you cannot establish a nice running IV. Even if even if you have a nice running something, you can easily put an um, ION. It's still okay. It's not a big deal. Uh, however, we prefer to have central lines when we go up to the OR. But as I said, it is very good. It's life-saving. And you may also uh, share the same thing with me. Sometimes it takes like 30 minutes for us to set up an IV for a, a lady undergoing a laparoscopic cholestectomy, right? So it's possible. So uh, not everyone has great veins and uh, not everybody has a capability of putting a central line in easily or have a, uh, access to ultrasound nowadays. So um, interosseous needles or just interosseous root is a life-saving uh, thing. And as far as I know, the Learning curve is maybe you, you may comment about this thing. Learning curve is not crazy, you know. So it's just you can teach every, almost on, virtually everyone to uh, yeah. If we use IO needles, I'm a great enthusiast of the intraosseous needles, and um, yeah. there is lots of experience that came from uh, a British Army, a British uh, medics in the British Army during Afghanistan campaign, um, and their approach for. Uh, soldiers who are blown by mines and things, you know, where literally their legs been blown away and the tourniquet been put in, they were brought up into yeah. the hospital. Uh, the um, the guys will do um, uh, intraosseous needles if the legs were still there in the, into the uh, tibial tuberosity. Uh, um, the, if they were not, they will go into the head of, I was about to say yes head of the humerus, and sometimes they go three or four, sometimes even five into the sternum as well. And they're not just the simple one uh, in process needles with just one needle in. They actually have five needles there. So they yeah. go in and then uh, then the infusion goes uh, of the whole blood 
goes straight from through, through uh, those introsis needles because they are quite often shut down. You cannot find anything, uh, any peripheral access. So they are good Absolutely. for trauma addiction. And yeah. so that leads me to my last questions. What is your opinion on giving whole blood? Well, especially um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, whole blood in in a you know in a perfect world is an ideal world, fantastic. But uh, unfortunately, the data is not super supportive of just using whole blood as a huge. I mean, the entire blood management protocol. So uh, we are not living in an ideal world. Even though United States is one of the leading country in the world uh, for the excess of easy blood transfusion, because there are a huge uh, public culture here to donate blood. So uh, it's still super expensive. I mean, I'm not talking about just money, but for the effort and the, for people's sacrifice to give uh, blood. So you should be always on the um, evidence-based site to use a blood component or a blood itself. So if it's a major, uh, it's a, uh, a trauma, I mean, of course, trauma means, you know, a, a penetrating trauma or a blast or something. Yes, it is good to go with the blood, uh, whole blood, but uh, almost all the time we go with uh, some uh, packed red blood cells and then uh, platelets and also the FFPs, just yeah. as we, how we need it, yes. Interesting, because again, um, I've, I've seen presentation of somebody who was involved in the Afghanistan um, uh, campaign, and they were talking about giving uh, a lot of, I mean, I mean a lot, like a whole circulating blood volume of a uh, whole blood, fresh blood, which is uh, warmed what, and you, going through. In, you in, have it, fine. No, I mean, we don't have it in, in, in normal yeah. hospitals. I'm talking yeah. about the military hospitals who yeah, are absolutely. close absolutely. to the yeah. field with young soldiers who were just hit. You know, there is no problems. And lots of them do not actually develop the massive blood transfusion. That's the beauty yeah. of the whole fresh blood because there is no preservative or not a lot of preservatives yes. there. You know, it's fresh. The oxygen carrying capacity of that blood is high. So the, the results are good for, for giving um, a whole blood, even in a okay. large volume. Um, Oleg, would you like to, to, to join? Maybe you already have some uh, experience in um, or have heard of your colleagues in, in Ukraine giving whole blood to victims. Um, unfortunately, maybe fortunately now we don't have any experience. I mean, this time, this time. But in, from the last time, of course, we uh, we uh, you, uh, we used uh, the blood in our hospital stool when we have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people with any uh, any destroyed maybe destroyed the injuries uh, too and maybe now we must uh, we must be ready for such situation uh, too. Okay, um, I can see one more question that came from. Um Anna, Sophia, and Antoine, um, they say, would you treat pregnant women the same way? Huh. I'm not what? sure what they're asking about, but it's the whole scenario about the pregnant Perfect. Trophy. Perfect question. Because, yes, we have actually plans. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, resource for the pregnant patients. So the, the, let me tell you like this. You know, the, the Washington University in San Luis School of Medicine doesn't have a hospital. All right, you may say, oh, what's going on? And the Barnes Jewish organization doesn't have physicians. So why should provides the physicians, Barnes Jewish provides the hospitals. So as the organization, we are, we are having a symbiotic life. So we have the OBGN in the other campus. I mean, the same campus, but in the South, I mean, in the North campus, it is like, in between the you know the buildings with the bridges and the tunnels, it takes like more than ten minutes to walk over there. And however, whenever we have a trauma victim who is pregnant, we all have the pediatricians, we all have the OBGM people, regardless of the age of the pregnancy, ready for uh, in case we need to discharge the baby. Okay, um, the principles are more or less the same thing, but 
You may also uh, think about that uh, there's a considerable big organ uterus with a pregnant uterus. So the, the preload might be affected. So you have to position the patient. And if it is, if you believe that the, the, the baby will be viable, you may anytime consider doing a cesarean section and just let the baby survive this tragedy. And um, almost not a dying patient, uh, pregnant patients, especially in the first and the second, especially in the second trimester, they survive uh, the, this thing. If, as I said, if it's not a crazy big trauma, uh, just a, maybe a stabbing or just one single gunshot wound to, for instance, to liver or something, it can be manageable. And for the third trimester, if it is over 32, 33 weeks, uh, there's a chance that the patient, uh, the, the, the fetus is super high chance of uh, uh, surviving. So you may consider a cesarean section at the same time. Or in the first trimester, of course, there's nothing to do. We, you, you just monitorize the, uh, the pregnancy uh, for other means, you know. But the, 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 the principles are more or less the same. But you, you need some more people uh, ready for your uh, in case they need it. You need them. Absolutely. You always need uh, you always need pediatrician. You always need obstetrician who may deliver. Absolutely. Absolutely. To save that trauma victim delivery quite often is yes. the best way of actually stabilizing their their, their yeah. condition. Before I go to the last question, I can see I would like to the audience. Well, I'd like to thank you, the audience, first of all, for joining us today. We had a uh, 130, I think, pa um, uh, participants listening at some point. Um, if you would like to, to donate, it's, it's your choice. Um, it's obviously free webinar, but if you're uh, willing to donate, um, you know what to do. There is a button there for you to, to click uh, and, and please consider donation. That will help um, uh, Ukrainian doctors um, and Ukrainian army fighting this horrible, um, horrible war. Um, and, and my last question is, um, um, who among the team of the doctors who is taking care of that patient who was delivered to your hospital becomes the, an attending physician, becomes his nominated physician, or such thing does not exist? Yeah, Andre. so um, as I said, we have an organization called ACCS, a good uh, critical care surgery thing. Even though it, it says just surgery, it's not just surgery. It is uh, actually the most important uh, two people is a trauma attending, I mean the, the surgeon, and the trauma anesthesiologist. So here in Washu, uh, 724, the entire year, we have one trauma anesthesi anesthesiologist ready. Actually, we have a shift starting 645 in the morning till 7 p.m. One trauma anesthesiologist just dedicated himself or herself to trauma patients. And the other one shows up at 7 p.m. till to 6.45 early in the morning with the morning huddle, uh, you know, we change people. And that's the same thing for the uh, weekends also, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., and vice versa. Yeah. And the trauma, uh, as I said, uh, surgeons, almost all the time we have two trauma surgeons. One is dedicated just for the traumas, and he shows up or she shows up every single level one traumas downstairs to the ED. And that's the same thing for us. So we have the pagers nowadays, we have the iPhones. So whenever you receive the, the page, you immediately go downstairs and check. And almost all the time our, uh, we call firefighter, the anesthesia resident, which is most of the time the last year resident, accompany you uh, during their trauma shift. And you have, and also uh, the, OR uh, front desk sends a representative downstairs just to check what's going on. But um, there are also very, is a strong emergency department here. So emergency department attendings also involve, but they don't have the authority to decide to go on with the surgery or send that. So as I said, they love to do the airway and we are okay with that. Yeah. Uh, we are just observing the airway but if something is going wrong, or if I believe that as an attending, uh, there is something going on, I immediately tell my resident, okay, just we are taking over the airway. 
or we are taking over the central line, whatever. So uh, the the answer is trauma surgeon and trauma anesthesiologist. Okay. But the trauma surgeon has the authority to say, okay, we, we are going upstairs and nobody questions that. Sure. We'll question it afterwards. You know, whenever everything is settled down, uh, there are some certain committees uh, just saying, okay, you did something good, you did something wrong. Why didn't you open? Almost all the time, they say, why didn't you operate this patient? But it's pretty much unlikely. Whenever we have a positive fast and a positive CT scan, we never wait and we immediately go upstairs. And we have resource for that. Uh, even like three o'clock in the morning, we can run two or three trauma rooms at the very same time. We can ask more people in and uh, we can accommodate that rooms. So basically, um, it's the trauma surgeon who becomes the nominated physician. Yes. After, for yes. example, patient has been operated, they go back to the ward, they will look after them for days and weeks and whatnot until they are free. Yeah. It, the thing is, uh, we have something called 44 ICU. It's a surgical ICU. And uh, maybe half of the beds, I'm not quite sure maybe half, but quite an amount of beds is just dedicated for the trauma patients who is coming from the ED up to the ICU. So... There are always some available beds. Even in the COVID time, we spared some beds for trauma victims because we are the one, not a, one of the most important trauma centers in the nation, especially in the Midwest. We cannot ignore. Even we were suffering the hardest time for the COVID, we still have some room for these trauma victims because this is the reality. They people keep happens, on, yeah, people people each other, so and do all the yeah. crazy stuff. Fantastic. I think we, uh, we've we been going for about an hour and a half. It's been, yep. it's been a blast, as they say in trauma. <laughs> um, I, I've been immensely enjoying myself talking to you and asking questions and uh, joining the, in, the, in the discussion. I think, I want, I'm hoping it will be useful for our Ukrainian colleagues of what we've discussed today. So just to reiterate, we spoke about the induction agents and we're pretty much happy that ketamine should be the uh, agent of choice. We spoke yeah. about uh, the maintenance of anesthesia and to avoid using unnecessary things like this, we should really stick to an inhalation anesthesia. And I would recommend sevoflurane if it's available. But isoflurane is also could be good um, mm -hmm. uh, as, as maintenance of anesthesia. Um, Zach mentioned fentanyl as the agent that is uh, available pretty much everywhere, has been available for 60 years and is good also for microcirculation. And don't worry about it if you don't have remifentanil. That is not Absolutely. required really for, the, for that kind of patients. We've spoken about the intravenous access uh, and we reiterated the message about intraosseous infusion if that is if that is possible on, on, on the field. We spoke about uh, the importance of uh, stopping bleeding, and particularly on the field, not opening the abdomen until you are in the hospital, until you've got the IV access and all yes. is there. We touched upon uh, some principles of uh, pregnant trauma victims. Um, and uh, yeah, so we uh, tranexamic acid as well and a whole blood transfusion. We spoke about a lot of things today. And I think uh, it's been a, a very, very useful chat. Um, and I'm grateful to Zach for, for agreeing to join us. And uh, I'm grateful to Oleg uh, for, for joining us too. Um, and I, I, I've enjoyed myself enormously. And I hope that the colleagues in Ukraine got something out of it, um, something useful that they, I hope not going to be use, using a lot, but God knows, who knows um, what can come through. We're all doctors and, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear friends. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to the Professor Nogli for your brilliant uh, lectures with a lot of answering for a lot of questions and for this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, and we thank you very much to you too. And because uh, this problem, I mean uh, combat trauma in our war time is maybe is the main uh, problem for us, for all uh, medical specialists, especially for anesthesiologists too. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we uh, sincerely invite you to Odessa just after this <coughs> war, especially in Odessa. I think uh, this time uh, will be very soon. Very good. Thank um, you so much.
Uh, dear listeners, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is one um, we're hoping, the Medvoice uh, and me, we are hoping that this will be uh, one of the many future webinars in this format where we'll invite a, um, a colleague from elsewhere. Uh, we're aiming uh, for this webinars to be in English. Um, uh, if you're not proficient in English, then I've been assured by the Medvoice that when you watch this webinar in recording, then the uh, subtitles will be provided for you um, as it does automatically. I think YouTube does it automatically later on, but not as you listen to it live. So you can listen to this um, um, webinar in recording on the YouTube for free. Um, uh, but the reason we do it in English is, is not to make it difficult for you, is to attract the international audience uh, who will be listening, who hopefully will be donating to help Ukraine uh, fight this battle um, and uh, for us all to succeed. Thank you very much. I think Thank we you. are. We are Thank you very much, guys. Bye bye. Right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Have a good evening.